Good morning, Prokoptan. I hope you are well. Today, we're going to hear from Musonius Rufus, a lesser-mentioned Stoic in contemporary times. I think it is, after all, pretty clear that Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and Seneca get 99, perhaps 0.9% of all the Stoic attention in pop culture, or perhaps it's better to say un-pop culture, as it's not like people are making Marvel films with any characters from the Stoic canon as superheroes. But pop culture, or unpop culture, popless culture, perhaps, you know what I mean. If you were new to philosophy, it would be easy for you to think these three guys were the only Stoics worth hearing from. But if Marcus is worth listening to, then Epictetus must be worth listening to because Marcus learned a lot, indirectly, from Epictetus. And if Epictetus is worth listening to, then Rufus must be as well because Rufus taught Epictetus. And on the topic of Epictetus, briefly, Michael Tremblay will swing by the podcast on Friday to talk about anger, regret, Epictetus, and, as it happened, mixed martial arts. So we will learn a bit more about the Musonius-Epictetus dynamic then, but certainly for now, we can all agree, even before hearing from Michael, that Rufus is probably worth hearing from. So we'll hear from him today. First, a quick thank you to a few new patrons. Thank you to Bing N., Carlos R., Nemo, Maddie Comics, Faye, Pep, John C., and Brian Hatch. If you're not already a patron, please consider becoming one by going to stoicismpod.com forward slash members. And another announcement, the store is live. It's back. I'm excited about that. I've got a t-shirt and a hoodie in there you might want to go check out, and I'll add more things in the coming weeks. You can go to store.stoicismpod.com. Okay, shout-outs done, thank yous done, store announcement done, episode tease done for Friday, time for our customary two ads, and then we'll start our episode. Stick with me. I have used a lot of commerce platforms in the past. By far, the most robust is Shopify. No matter how complex your business needs and no matter how large your business grows, Shopify can handle it. And they do handle it for brands like Rothy's, Ruggable, Allbirds, Knox, Magnolia, Brooklinen, Glossier, and Cotton, to name a few. You may already use another e-commerce platform, and you may be super unhappy with it, but you've already put a lot of work into it, and migrating to Shopify could seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you that it is quite easy. When I migrated to Shopify back in 2022, their apps and tools meant I just had to make a few clicks, and everything was ported over as if by magic. Shopify also lets you design your storefront however you like, which, from personal experience, I know isn't the case for many other commerce platforms out there. All these features and all this control can result in more sales more often. So stop leaving sales on the table, switch your business to Shopify today, and discover why millions trust Shopify as their all-in-one commerce platform to build, grow, and run their businesses. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial at shopify.com forward slash practical, all lowercase. That's one month for just $1 at shopify.com forward slash practical, shopify.com forward slash practical. It's 2024, and I'd like you to kick off this somewhat arbitrary divide between past and future the right way, with a clear and focused mind that's prepared to take on the next 12 months. And so would my sponsor, Neurohacker. I have struggled with attention issues my whole life, and I've tried a lot of remedies to help me to overcome those struggles. Some didn't work, others had side effects, and others were too expensive or demanded an unrealistic amount of my time. Then, in 2022, I found Neurohacker's Qualia Mind Supplement. Qualia Mind is a nootropic that combines 28 of the most research-backed nootropic ingredients on Earth into the ultimate brain fuel formula, Qualia Mind. And it's been changing people's lives now for years, including my own. The formula is non-GMO, gluten-free, even vegan, and all its ingredients work in concert to assist your brain in achieving focus and clarity. It's also backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, which I doubt you'll need, but is always a nice thing to have just in case. If you struggle with attention or focus issues, or if you'd just like a boost in these areas, see what the best brain fuel formula on earth can do for you. Go to neurohacker.com forward slash practical for up to $100 off Qualia Mind. And as a listener of Practical Stoicism, use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off at checkout. That's neurohacker.com forward slash practical and use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off to experience life-changing mental performance from Qualia Mind. (music) 
Musonius was once asked whether or not daughters should receive the same educations as sons, and separately, and what we'll talk about today, whether or not women should learn philosophy. His response is worth going over, and that's what we're going to do today. Stoicism can seem like a man's philosophy, especially when you first approach it, and especially due to the fact that ancient Greek philosophy seems, for whatever reason, in contemporary times and pop culture, to be the domain of mostly men. That's not the case, of course, but it can seem that way. And it's worth realizing, of course, that if Stoicism in particular was only for men, it would be like suggesting that only men were capable of obtaining virtue the knowledge of how to live excellently. But if virtue is knowledge of any kind, then any mind is capable of achieving it. And this is irrespective of genitalia, hormones, or physical attributes. A man and a woman have the same sort of rational faculty. They have a brain. Their bodies do, of course, vary slightly. And these variations do seem to present normative differences on the average. But just like a man can learn math, a woman can learn math. It would be silly to suggest otherwise. And just like a woman can learn carpentry, a man can learn carpentry. And just like a man can learn virtue, a woman can learn virtue. At least this seems logical. But what does Musonius think of that idea? Does he agree or does he not? To know, we're going to have to hear it from the man himself, or rather through the student that recorded his lectures. And that seems to be Arian, but that is not exactly how we get Musonius's lectures. I'm a bit fuzzy on this, but I believe the text we have from Musonius comes from Strobius, which was provided in the 5th century AD, but that Strobius is basing his writing on the writings compiled by Arian, who was, of course, the student of Epictetus that wrote down the Enchiridion and was also a student of Lucius. So Arian is a student of Lucius and Epictetus, and he wrote down what both of these individuals would say in their classes. And both of these individuals, Lucius and Epictetus, spoke about Musonius. So my understanding is that the text we have that we suppose to be the writing of Musonius is third hand in that Musonius said a thing, Lucius and Epictetus talk about the things that Musonius said, perhaps even wrote about them. Arian compiled various texts of Lucius and Epictetus talking about Musonius and what Musonius said, and Strobius sometime later, took Arian's work and compiled it into what we now know, I believe, as the fragments and lectures of Musonius Rufus. No internet back then, folks. No computers. So everything must be taken with a grain of salt here. We don't have, I don't think, a really firm historical record, right? These things are written on parchment paper, papyrus, something. It doesn't last that long, if not well taken care of. But if what follows is completely accurate, it means that Musonius, who lived in the first century AD, the very early half of the first century AD, had his works recorded and transmitted across hundreds of years on the back of what I presume could be considered ancient cocktail napkins, and that it would be incredible if this was 100% accurate. Those things said, and to the best of my knowledge, Cora Lutz's work, Cora is the woman whose translation I'm working from, hasn't been called into question, and these fragments from Musonius seem widely accepted as being accurate and true. However, I do think it's important to always point out the fact that there's a lot of what I think might best be described as good faith trust in sources when we are reading the interpretations of the interpretations of interpretations, I guess. That said, again, everything that follows in what I'll quote from Musonius's answer to these questions is, as far as I know, as accurate as we can know it to be. So for whatever it's worth, here is Musonius's full answer. Also, this is 2,000 years ago, folks, so you can expect some points of view here that aren't in keeping with our modern sensibilities. Let's not get hung up on that. Let's try to focus on Musonius's larger point and let go the fact that some of what he says might not go over well were he to say it today, right? Let's focus on the big picture, not the tiny details. When someone asked him if women too should study philosophy, he began to discourse on the theme that they should in somewhat the following manner. Women, as well as men, he said, have received from the gods the gift of reason, which we use in our dealings with one another and by which we judge whether a thing is good or bad, right or wrong. Likewise, the female has the same senses as the male, namely sight, 
hearing, smell, and the others. Also, both have the same parts of the body, and one has nothing more than the other. Moreover, not men alone, but women too, have a natural inclination toward virtue and the capacity for acquiring it. And it is the nature of women, no less than men, to be pleased by good and just acts, and to reject the opposite of these. If this is true, by what reasoning would it ever be appropriate for men to search out and consider how they may lead good lives, which is exactly the study of philosophy, but inappropriate for women? How could it be that it is fitting for men to be good, but not for women? Let us examine in detail the qualities which are suitable for a woman who will lead a good life, for it appears that each one of them would accrue to her most readily from the study of philosophy. In the first place, a woman must be a good housekeeper, that is a careful account of all that pertains to the welfare of her house and be capable of directing the household slaves. It is my contention that these are the very qualities which would be present particularly in the woman who studies philosophy, since obviously each of them is a part of life, and philosophy is nothing other than knowledge about life. And the philosopher, as Socrates says, quoting Homer, is constantly engaged in investigating precisely this, quote, whatsoever of good and evil is wrought in thy halls, end quote. But above all, a woman must be chaste and self-controlled, She must, I mean, be pure in respect of unlawful love, exercise restraint in other pleasures, be not a slave to desire, not be contentious, not lavish in expense, nor extravagant in dress. Such are the works of a virtuous woman, and to them I would add yet these, to control her temper, not to be overcome by grief, and to be superior to uncontrolled emotion of every kind." Now these are the things which the teachings of philosophy transmit, and the person who has learned them and practices them would seem to me to have become a well-ordered and seemly character, whether man or woman. Well then, so much for self-control. As for justice, would not the woman who studies philosophy be just? Would she not be a blameless life partner? Would she not be a sympathetic helpmate? Would she not be an untiring defender of husband and children? And would she not be entirely free of greed and arrogance? And who better than a woman trained in philosophy would be disposed to look upon doing a wrong as worse than suffering one, and to regard being worsted as better than gaining an unjust advantage? Moreover, who better than she would love her children more than life itself? What woman could be more just than such a one? Now, as for courage, certainly it is to be expected that the educated woman will be more courageous than the uneducated, and one who has studied philosophy than one who has not, and she will not therefore submit to anything shameful because of fear of death or unwillingness to face hardship, and she will not be intimidated by anyone because he is of noble birth or powerful or wealthy, no, not even if he be the tyrant of her city. For, in fact, she has schooled herself to be high-minded, and to think of death not as an evil, and life not as a good, and likewise not to shun hardship and never for a moment to seek ease and indolence. So it is that such a woman is likely to be energetic, strong to endure pain, prepared to nourish her children at her own breast, and to serve her husband with her own hands, and willing to do things which some would consider no better than slaves' work. Would not such a woman be a great help to the man who married her? an ornament to her relatives, and a good example for all who knew her? Of course, but I assure you some will say that women who associate with philosophers are bound to be arrogant for the most part and presumptuous, in that abandoning their own households and turning to the company of men, they practice speeches, talk like sophists, and analyze syllogisms when they ought to be sitting at home spinning. I should not expect the women who study philosophy to shirk their appointed tasks for mere talk any more than men, but I maintain that their discussions should be conducted for the sake of their practical application. For as there is no merit in the science of medicine unless it conduces to the healing of a man's body, so if a philosopher has or teaches reason, it is of no use if it does not contribute to the virtue of a man's soul. Above all, we ought to examine the doctrine which we think women who study philosophy ought to follow, 
we ought to see if the study which presents modesty as the greatest good can make them presumptuous, if the study which is a guide to the greatest self-restraint accustoms them to live heedlessly, if what sets forth temperance as the greatest evil does not teach self-control, if what represents the management of a household as a virtue does not impel them to manage well their homes. Finally, the teachings of philosophy exhort a woman to be content with her lot and to work with her own hands. Now, certainly there are more than a few squirmy moments in there, but only because of the gender roles assumed at the time that this was written. If we forgive that for being a product of its age, Musonius is saying something incredibly equitable by almost any time's standards, that virtue is the recognition of your place your roles, your duties, and how to be decent, and that while this might be different for men and women on the whole, and absolutely is different from individual to individual, it is everyone's responsibility, as a Stoic anyway, to figure it out and to do it. Gender roles today are, of course, for the most part, not looked upon fondly, although that's not entirely true. Some people still embrace them, and that's, of course, their personal decisions. At least that's the case in what we call mainstream content or media or pop culture. But this lecture isn't about gender roles at all. It's something far less dichotomous than that. It's about what is a human's duty, a human's duty that such duty has nothing to do with sex or gender, and that every gender can fill that duty dutifully and just as well as any other gender. Back then, women were housekeepers, but now they're not. They're CEOs and lawyers and doctors and all the things that men can be. They can, of course, still choose to be housekeepers, but that's not the only thing they're allowed to choose anymore. So now, whatever a woman's role is, or whatever a man's role is, the overarching point of it all remains the same. Regardless of the gender role, or how we define them, the following things are still true today, and I think Musonius would agree. First, we must take careful account and provide careful care and concern to those things which are within our domain of responsibility, whatever that is and whoever we are. Next, that we must be pure in respect of unlawful love, exercise restraint in other pleasures, be not a slave to desire, be not contentious, be not lavish in expense, nor extravagant in dress. We must control our temper, not be overcome by grief when we find it on our doorstep, and we must try to be superior to uncontrolled emotion of any kind, again, regardless of who we are or what we are, so long as we're human. We would also seek to be blameless life partners, sympathetic helpmates, untiring defenders of our partners, friends, and children, and entirely free of greed and arrogance. We should still look upon doing a wrong as worse than suffering a wrong, and we should regard being wronged as better than gaining an unjust advantage. Or in other words, we should accept being wronged over a desire to cheat. And then lastly, we should also want not to submit to anything shameful out of fear of death or an unwillingness to face hardship. We should also endeavor not to be intimidated by anyone just because they are of noble birth, if they're important or powerful or wealthy, not even if they be the tyrant of the city we live in. So if we remove the gender stuff from everything Musonius said, we're left with something that, again, is very equitable. We're left with Musonius saying that everyone should care about their circles of concern. Everyone should care not to be a slave to desire. Everyone should control their temper. Everyone should not be overcome by grief and should be able to remain strong in turbulent times. Everyone should effort to be blameless. Everyone should look at doing wrong as worse than being wronged. And everyone should be courageous and fearless. In short, Musonius is saying of women in particular. Of course they should study philosophy, you idiotic rube, and for all the same reasons that you should. Now, I find it necessary here to point out that there are a handful of stoic bros on the internet that insist the word virtue comes from the root ver, which means man or masculinity, and so women cannot achieve virtue and thus have no business being stoics or practicing stoicism. Well, the fact is that these dumb dummy heads are only right if they think Stoicism isn't Greek. Greeks didn't speak Latin, they spoke Greek. And the Greek that was transliterated into virtue in Latin is erite. 
So the original word wasn't virtue. That's what the Romans used, but it wasn't what the Greeks who invented this philosophy used. Arete not only has nothing to do with any gender in particular, but it was embodied by the goddess Arete, one of a tandem team of goddesses, the other being Homonoia, who together were the exactors of justice in Greek tradition. So to suggest in any way that women are capable of being annexed from virtue pursuit or the pursuit of virtue is insanely stupid. And I would invite anyone who thought otherwise to read a book, a Stoic book, for example. (laughs) Romans were, of course, far more bro than Greeks were, culturally speaking. And I'm not, in this case, necessarily using bro as a pejorative. Masculinity and mental toughness and strength and being a Roman, that was very much more in the masculine vein than anything in Greece ever was. So it might be that there is some truth to how the Romans at large, not Roman Stoics or Roman philosophers in general, but Roman everyday people, there might be some truth in how they thought about virtue and masculinity and virtue being a attribute of men. But the Stoic philosophy and Stoic tradition transcends that sort of nonsense, and Musonius knew that for certain. Of course, that doesn't mean he doesn't have a different view about the roles that pertain to genders 2,000 years ago. He clearly did. It would have been impossible for him not to. But it does mean that he doesn't think gender gets in the way of sagehood. And having seen how my own wife, for example, has bared this pregnancy as she goes into her third trimester, I might have to go back on previous statements about sagehood being an ideal and not a real thing. Because if anyone is a sage, it's my wife and not me. And Zeno would almost certainly agree. So should women practice philosophy? Yes. Can women achieve virtue? Yes. Can women become sages? If men can, if anyone can, then yes, of course. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I appreciate you being here every Monday and Friday. Remember this Friday, Michael Tremblay drops by to talk about Epictetus and mixed martial arts, and we will wrap those two things quite haphazardly in a discussion about anger, rage, and regret, and dealing with those things. Again, thank you for being here. If you're not yet a patron of my work, you can go to stoicismpod.com forward slash members to become one. I would really appreciate that. And until next time, take care. 